Now, let's talk about the second part of this chapter, which is radioactivity. In this subtopic, you will come to learn a new term called background radiation. Now, background radiation is defined as the radiation that exists around us at all time. There are two types of background radiation, which is natural sources and man-made sources. Every second of the day, there are some radiation emitted from natural sources such as radon gas, rocks and buildings, cosmic ray from space, carbon-14. Although most background radiation is natural, a small amount of it comes from artificial sources such as medical and nuclear waste. All radiation that exists can be detected by a device. In your syllabus, the geiger muller tube is the most common device used to measure and detect radiation. So, how does it do that? Firstly, radiation goes into the tube here. When it gets into the tube, it will ionize the air inside the tube, creating sparks, making click sounds. These click sounds can be said as electrical pulse, which is then transmitted to a counting machine. So, the greater the frequency of clicks, the higher the count rate will be, which means that there is more radiation. So, if a radiation source is further away from the tube, the lower the count rate is detected. Moving on to isotopes, which I am sure you are familiar with. They are elements with the same number of protons, but a different number of neutrons. Usually, only one or two of the isotopes are stable. When there is an imbalance of protons and neutrons, isotopes tend to be more unstable. This means that they are more likely to undergo radioactive decay as we saw an example of uranium-235 previously breaking into two. Anyway, in order for this to become stable, they emit radiation such as alpha particles, beta particles, or gamma radiation. We are going to talk about three parts, their ionizing effect, how penetrating each of them are, and how they deflect in a magnetic and electric field. Firstly, the ionizing effect of radiation. Ionization is the process of which an atom becomes negative or positive by gaining or losing electrons. So, the ionizing effect for alpha, beta, and gamma depends on two factors, the kinetic energy and the charge of the type of radiation. Meaning, the higher the kinetic energy of the radiation, the more ionizing it is. And, the greater the charge of the radiation, the more ionizing it will be. Let's look at how the charges works first. An alpha particle has a charge of plus 2. A beta particle has a charge of negative 1 and gamma radiation a charge of 0. This means alpha radiation has the highest charge and we learned that the greater the charge, the more ionizing it is. So, alpha particle here is the most ionizing. Now, let's look into the second factor which was the kinetic energy. Alpha particles has the greatest mass, therefore it holds the highest kinetic energy, hence the most ionizing. Beta particle is very light and gamma radiation has no mass. Therefore, this concludes that alpha is the most ionizing followed by beta particle and gamma being the least ionizing. The second part we are going to discuss is the penetrating power. Alpha, beta, and gamma, each of them have different properties. So this means that they penetrate materials in different ways. Alpha particles can be stopped by a piece of paper Beta particles can be stopped by a few millimeters of aluminium and gamma rays can be stopped by several inches of thick lead. Now pause this video and please remember the orders for alpha, beta and gamma in their ionizing effect and penetrating power. It's a common question that they will ask you in your paper 4 theory. So make sure you understand this very well and remember all these. And the last part, the third part, is the deflection of alpha, beta, and gamma in electric and magnetic field. A particle is deflected in an electric field if it has charge. Alpha particles are deflected towards the negative plate since it is positively charged. Beta is negatively charged, so it will be deflected towards the positive plate. As gamma ray has no charge, it will not be deflected and it travels straight through between the plates. 
As for magnetic fields, it's a little bit more complicated. The direction is worked out using the Fleming left hand rule, which I will be explaining this in more detail on a separate video. You can watch it to understand how Fleming left hand rule applies for magnetic field. But as a brief explanation here, you have to know that in a magnetic field, alpha and beta are deflected in opposite directions like this and gamma rays are not changed. Bear in mind that beta deflects at a shorter range than alpha. Okay, now that we have understood the nature and behavior of alpha, beta and gamma emissions, let's discuss radioactivity decay. Radioactive decay is the change in an unstable nucleus resulting in emission of alpha particles or beta particles and or gamma radiation. Emission of alpha, beta or gamma changes the nucleus into another element which is more stable. This process is spontaneous and random. Let's see what happens when a nucleus emits an alpha particle. Alpha is a helium nucleus. Therefore, two protons and two neutrons are emitted. The mass number decreases by 4 and the atomic number, which is the proton number, decreases by 2. This equation here is an expression of a radioactive reaction which we call as a decay equation. What happens when a nucleus emits beta particles? A neutron turns into a proton and electron. Proton stays in the nucleus. Fast-moving electron, beta particle, are emitted. Mass number is unchanged. Atomic, which is proton number, is increased by 1. And lastly, what happens when a radioactive element emits a gamma ray? A high-energy electromagnetic wave is released from an atom. There will be no change to mass number or proton number. As mentioned previously, the nucleus after radioactive decay will become stable. This is because the number of excess neutrons has now been decreased. Moving into half-life. Half-life can be defined as the time taken for half the radioactive nuclei to decay. Hereby, you have a graph showing the activity of a substance with a half-life of 10 years. After 10 years, half the original nuclei in the radioactive isotope have decayed. After 20 years, another half the remaining nuclei in the radioactive isotope have decayed to become half. Let's say an isotope iodine-129 was found in a radioactive waste from nuclear power station. Isotope-129 has a half-life of 10 million years. This sample of iodine has an activity of 288 kilobacterial. What is the activity of the sample after 60 million years? Step 1. Calculate how many half-lives have passed. If one half-life equals to 10 million years, therefore 60 million years tells us that 6 half-lives have passed. Step 2. Set up a number line to calculate the activity after 6 half-lives. After each half-life, your sample activity is reduced into half and you will be left with only 4.5 kilobacterial of remaining nuclei. I will discuss more examples which include background radiation for half-life calculation in a separate video. Now, let's finish off this chapter by talking about some uses of radiation and safety precaution on how to handle them. Radiation can be used in smoke alarms, eradicating food to kill bacteria, measuring and controlling thickness of materials, and diagnosis and treatment of cancer. You can pause this video and write down how the radiation applies to real-life application. Moving on to the last part of this chapter, safety precautions in handling radioactive substances. Exposure to ionizing nuclear radiation can be very harmful which leads to dead cells in the body, mutations, and cancer. Therefore, precautions must be taken in these three areas. Disposing of radioactive waste with a long half-life, storing radioactive sources, and lastly, being around radioactive sources. I advise you to pause this video and write down all the important points in the application of radioactive substances and the safety precautions in handling these radioactive substances. So that wraps up everything that you should know in Chapter 5 Nuclear Physics. I would really appreciate it if you guys could subscribe, like, and comment on this video so you can keep continue watching videos like this. Thank you, have a nice day.